What is up, Sleep Tribe? Welcome to a brand new episode of the Healthy Sleep Revolution podcast. I am your host, Dr. Magna Dasani, and today I have somebody I've been stalking for a long time, and in a good way, because she is amazing. She blows me away with her passion and with everything she's doing. Let's welcome Dr. Allison Cole. Did I say your name right? You did. Thank you so much, Meg. It's so wonderful to be here. And I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to really pursue the passion of sleep, just like me. We're not that different. Yeah, We're not that different. Yeah, and it's very to exciting to meet you know, people who share my passion as well. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for taking time to be here today. You are board certified in all kinds of things, sleep, pulmonary, critical care medicine. What prompted your journey into all of this? How did you get here? Tell I us. Had well, many, many I'm going to have to tell you the cliff notes pulmonary version function because testing. I Back tend to talk as way a too much kid, about this. And I want to focus on all these the good that comes from the bad. And I remember so helping them with I started out your typical gung ho, really excited about like critical care this kind wall of, girl. of drips. It sounded so overwhelming but yet I was so in admiration of how challenging a role that must be to really care for those patients. Everyone from the physicians, nurses, to the bedside folks, like it, it was a no small feat to get you know, mm-hmm. that type of thing done. And so that became my initial passion. But then as you get older and you start to meet new people, um, and you know, you travel through the circle of residency and fellowship. I had a really special fellowship program. So shout out to the Cedar Sinai Fellowship Program. We got a lot of exposure to sleep medicine, and that sort of sowed the seeds, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I, my dad had some health issues. I wanted to kind of become a pulmonary critical care, like a legitimate uh, attending, if you will. So I took that on. Then I was like, what's this whole sleep thing about? It seems like I'm missing a part of my training. And I went back and did a sleep fellowship. So I returned to California for a year after returning back to New Jersey, my roots. And the rest, as they say, is proverbial history. I just spent a year really focusing on every aspect of sleep that I could possibly learn about. And I also spent a year, quite frankly, not taking call. I spent a year that I had not seen since before I went to college, like being able to sleep a solid seven and a half hours uninterrupted. But I I didn't realize that impact. And that kind of, that's really what sort of drove me to this slowly percolating obsession with sleep that just grew and grew and grew over time. You know, I, I did, I paid my dues. I did a lot of COVID call. And quite frankly, that was something that really made me realize just the importance of just sleep in my own life. And also the bigger picture of things. Like when Mm -hmm. you see what I saw, the types of patients that were dying in my ICU over and over and over again. It felt like rinse repeat. These are people that despite their age, they were obese. They had hypertension. Some of them had diabetes. They clearly had a missed opportunity to diagnose sleep apnea. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Hence my mm-hmm. interest in discussing with this and, and my passion with co-op, you know, uh, coordinating care with dentists. It was a problem. And I was like, all of a sudden, I was just like, I, I'm not satisfied with putting a Band-Aid on the boo-boo. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we reverse this? Like, we got to reverse engineer what we're doing. We're thinking about medicine all wrong. We keep thinking it, uh, of it as a reactive. We're trained to be reactive. You right. have a problem. I do this for that problem. And believe me, I will never forget those roots. But the perspective that I drew from being able to take a step back and reflect, I was like, I'm not going to be on the planet for very long if I don't start prioritizing my own health. And I can see clearly people who are not able to prioritize their health are in the predicament that they're in. COVID being just but one example of many, many, many. It just was, it was so in my face. It was undeniable that it was time for me to grow as a physician and pivot. And this obsession with sleep as prevention sort of was born in a nutshell. Love it. Love it. A couple of points that struck home and I'm like, oh, I got to ask her about this. You mentioned getting those seven and a half hours of sleep, which I know you see this as much as I do, is not normal, right? We have so many people that either use it as 
almost a badge of honor, right? Oh, I, I sleep for four hours. I got so much to do. Or I remember my uncles telling me when I was growing up, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Um, but sleep deprivation is real, right? You and I were talking earlier before we jumped onto this actual episode about how you believe it's a true epidemic. Let's talk about that. Absolutely. And I want your listeners to know this is not like Dr. Cole's opinion about chronic sleep deprivation. This is something that I've really looked into. And the CDC has even looked into it. And if you really sort of unearth the scab, if you will, ugly. It's ugly behind there. Literally, the majority, there's about half of us are feeling sleep deprived. If you look across, when we look at chronic sleep deprivation across the entire population, it's roughly 30-ish percent or so of people are sleep deprived. And then if you break down the data, specifically in teenagers, this, my mind almost exploded. It is over 70% oh of teenagers in this country. Seven zero. And if you look at the state of New Jersey, where I am in currently, it's more like 80% when you break it down. And then the adolescents aren't doing much better. It's, you know, upwards of 60%. So as we are, so what it tells me is this is number one, very common. In fact, it is the most common if you pull aside the word insomnia. So what I mean by that is when I was digging through and you read a lot of things and mm -hmm. you know, you Google thing, oh, well, what's the most common sleep disorder? Some people would argue it'd be insomnia. But if you include insomnia, you really need to break it down to every single one of us has had insomnia at some point. I, I don't mm -hmm. know anybody who hasn't, right? But the key is, is it acute and is it transient or is this really a chronic issue? And it may be underdiagnosed because people may not be talking about it, but if you look really specifically at chronic insomnia, it actually kind of falls a little bit below what we see for chronic sleep deprivation. So really chronic sleep deprivation is the one thing that's sort of universal. And it leads me to a conclusion, which is, and you alluded to it actually, it's the idea of our culture of American culture, and then also the subculture within America, right? Because we're not all, quote, first-generation American. There's a lot of us that come. I, I particularly looked at the Asian literature because I found it so fascinating having, you know, being, um, you know, being half Korean. And we really don't, like Japan and Korea are probably the top two that really do not respect sleep in any kind of way. And I challenge you, and you've heard it, you mentioned your uncle, like I, challenge you to find someone of Asian descent, no matter what part of Asia that really prioritizes sleep. To your Correct. point, it literally is a badge of honor. It's like, yes, I mean, my attitude was, if I'm going to get through, if I'm going to make it to that next milestone of success, right? Getting into dental school, getting into medical school, getting through your residency, getting to your fellowships, being a big bag of denning. It's like, well, how, you know, we used to joke about it. Like, you know, which person on their surgical rotation slept the less? Well, I didn't sleep a wink. Oh, well, <laughs> I managed to catch an hour. You almost felt like, am I naughty? Cause I caught an hour. And, and in reality, that's absurd thinking. But that's how we are trained, that it's just not important. You can get that next task. You're going to push off things like sleep. And in the end, it's like, what are we really working for in the end? I don't know. I think in hindsight, what you come to realize is you appreciate all of that hard work when you do sleep. And right. unearthing even further than that is the fact that many of us don't sleep. And I think especially in the Asian community. So I'm going to be biased and talk mostly about Asian community, but I think it applies to a lot of us, depending on what sector, even the types of jobs that we have may indicate whether or not sleep is prioritized. We're yes. focusing on healthcare, but look at the folks who work on Wall Street. Um, you know, there's so many examples of this. People who do a lot of shift work, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they do the the graveyard shift, they're going to make some extra money often. And right. that to them is like, well, that's the difference between taking my family on a nice vacation or not, you know, or if I'm just paying my bills. And well, if it means that I'm not sleeping as well, kind of like who cares, right? So there's this, this cultural construct in this country. And then there's this concept too, for the high achieving folks, and I would put myself in that category, who sort of felt like sleeping is bad because I'm not going to be as productive. I'm not going to study as much. I'm going to get one less question right on that test because I didn't study the material for an extra hour like I should have. I can tell you, I mean, I'm sure I went to school with a bunch of real smarty pants that maybe could prioritize their sleep more, but I always had that pressure like you can't sleep until you've covered this material one more time because you just need to do better than you think you can do. Absolutely. And 
The literature says no. It says we need to be more productive. It's insane. Like basically that if you sleep more, you will be more productive is my point. It's insanity when you think about it. It really it just is. doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, right? It's like we're as smart as we are. We never grasp that concept. <laughs> what do you find are the more common contributing factors to this, to sleep deprivation in our teenagers? I know you gave me those mind blowing statistics. Oh, than- ooh, social media. Ooh. Let's leave that out. <laughs> So I love that you're asking me specifically about teenagers because my kids now are seven and eight, soon to be nine. And I'm looking at them and I'm seeing these young ladies come before my eyes, which is on the one hand, wonderful to see them growing up. On the other hand, it's disturbing because they're so little. And I'm like, oh, I I love to see you evolve and grow as humans. And I'm, I know though, it's just one more step toward you being out of my house and going through those teenage years. But, you know, I think if there's, yes, there are a lot of pervasive cultural things. And you mentioned a big one, which is just the whole social media aspect of it. But if we take a step back and we get toward that comment I made earlier about shifting culture and priority. Mm -hmm. What's happened is we as a society in this country are not taking care of them. And that's a little bit risque for me to say, but I really want people to think about this. Think about when teenagers start school, they start school early, but what people fail to realize is, and this pretty much happens to almost every teenager, our little evolving brains as we develop, the timekeeper in our brain changes, meaning our circadian rhythm shift. So we have this natural delay to our sleep phase, meaning we basically don't have the urge to want to go to sleep until later. And Mm -hmm. we have this urge to sleep in as opposed to what I do now. And I, I don't know about you, Mega, but I can definitely tell you when I was a teenager, I 100% didn't, I mean, or even in college, right? Because this is definitely a pervasive issue in college. I definitely didn't feel like going to sleep before midnight on most days. But my school, I distinctly remember, I did not start school at seven o'clock in the morning. And for some people, if they're getting bussed, that may mean they're up at 6.30 in the morning to try to get to class. Well, just by virtue of their biology, some of these teens, they may not even have the urge to go to sleep until closer to two o'clock in the morning. And if they had their ideal time, they'd be sleeping, you know, 2 a.m to 10 a.m. And I get that that's not a realistic shift, but we need to think about as a society, we're trying to force them in like this works for our board of education. This works for coordinating the buses. This works for uh, all the towns around us. And when we have our after school activities and our meets and, and our football games, et cetera. Okay, great. But guess what? If we all thought collectively together and it's really, really, really hard. So I don't want to make it seem like it's easy. The bottom line is if we shift our culture to being more respectful, even if we just started the time at 8.30, which may be even the most realistic time that we can expect, right? It's not going to be perfection. But if we could delay, we would see improvements. It's been shown in states. I think I want to say it's Indiana, if I recall correctly, where I think they have part of their state is on one time and another part does like daylight savings time or daylight saving time. And they are actually able to show academic differences because the kids were getting more sleep. And it just, it, it makes sense. There are some states, you know, I I'm kind of bringing up the daylight saving time. And I know you spoke with Karen Johnson, who I just adore, you know, the bottom line is that I bring it up because it kind of goes hand in hand, because if you don't stop the daylight saving time, if you switch the school hours, you're still going to muck people up. You kind of have to do them together. But the idea being that, if we can delay school start time while we're actually being smart about the rest of us, which is that daylight saving time is just unnecessary. It doesn't really financially incentivize us to any great extent in this country. Um, And it goes against our circadian rhythm. If we could just respect sleep, we would be doing all of our teenagers a favor. So, you know, long-winded answer, but at the end of the day, changing school start times would be a big help. Mm -hmm. Maybe imperfect, but it would be a big help. And then there's other things that I think are really important, which is, you know, getting to the root cause of why teenagers love social media. Is it really that dopamine fix that a lot of people talk about? Like, oh, I'm getting hits and who's liking me and this picture and that? Or is it even a deeper issue? Like, are, are they losing sight of kind of what it's like to be old school? I mean, they just did not grow up like us. I mean, I had a rotary phone as a kid. Um, I knew what it was like to be bored, right? I know. I, I just, my daughter was just like, mommy, I'm bored. And I'm like, and it's okay to be bored. 
you will be more creative. Like use this time to actually think about something that you have not allowed your time to brain to process. I think getting our teenagers to be a little bit more comfortable with that, that period of nothingness, which I'm guilty of too. It's not, I mean, I grew up in a time when I had to be bored and now I don't have to be bored. And I actually have to actively fight the urge to be like, I'm going to pick up my phone and just Google this or do this or that. I mean, it's so pervasive, even of it, with us older generation that have had the opportunity to not have a computer at our fingertips, right? I tell my girls that you don't always need, I have two teenagers, by the way. So I was super excited to hear your thoughts. I have an 18, almost 19 year old and a 16 year old. So I get the, I can't fall asleep. Why can't I fall asleep? And I have to remind her sometimes that it's, it's your brain. It truly is. We have the shift happening. Yes, we need to work with it, but Sometimes it truly isn't your fault, um, but I completely get it. We did not have iPads and iPhones on every road trip. We actually looked outside the window and played games. Yeah. And you were forced to, cause you're like, well, I either, I was an only child. So I really went into my head on those trips. <laughs> I was like, I don't even have anybody to like, I don't know, bother or pester or like poke next to me when I'm on those road trips. Oh, what a trip <laughs> <laughs> down memory lane. <laughs> Um, what, what are some of the steps or the, um, remedies, I guess, that you would recommend people look into to help with, um, everything we've talked about the sleep deprivation, making sure they're getting enough rest, the change in school timings is probably not going to happen tomorrow or next year, Exactly. Mm -hmm. but we still got to work with our kiddos. So how, what are some of your suggestions that parents that are listening in can take into account for themselves, for their families. I love that you brought in for themselves and their families, because I think you hit on just creating, you know, we can't change American culture overnight, but the culture of sleep within the home, I do think is something that as parents, we are obligated to make a priority. Mm -hmm. And I'll use my kiddos as an example, sleep, we make sure is a priority in our home. And believe me, now I my almost nine-year-old is trying to push the boundaries of sleep all the time. I'm blessed because my seven-year-old's like, I'm ready to go to sleep, bye. And like, she pieces out if she's ready, right? She really just naturally prioritizes sleep. But my older one just liked to push the issue. So making sure even when you're on vacation and it seems so luxurious to kind of sleep in and, and maybe stay up a little bit later, that we don't indulge that, that you keep a routine. And it's one that, it's a routine that you ha yourself have to keep. You know, right. one of, we have rules in our family and believe me, my husband, if I try to break them, because I'm guilty of trying to break these rules <laughs> is like, Alison, I know you don't sleep well, so you are breaking your own rule. One is just being very consistent with our wake time, which I tell people who have trouble sleeping, but just because really what I'm talking about is just like when our kids are littler and just as we were once little, we like routine, our bodies like routine. So just accepting that we're human beings who need routine. And just saying, okay, well, what's a realistic wake up time that would work for me? And just sticking with that, even if it's the weekend. And then focusing not so much on obsessing about, oh, I'm not tired. I, you know, and this is something I recommend too is, you know, we got in this habit, I think a lot of us as parents of being like, it's time for bed. So you're just going to go up and go to bed. Well, for the most part, it has worked for my kids that are littler because they really are tired. They just are too little to accept that they're tired. But I'm putting them in bed when I know that they're going to be falling asleep relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Sticking your teenager in their room and just being like, you're going to be in here until you fall asleep. And they're in a bed. You know, some teenagers have really teeny tiny rooms. Not everybody has a big room where they have an extra bed and a chair and all this stuff. You know, this is not, a, that's a luxury. A lot of people don't have that. So being mindful of the fact that if your teenager is really not ready for bed, helping them create a routine that's a wind down routine that they can consistently do. And it starts with, let's not get on the electronics. And if you feel the need to be on the electronics, let's examine the why. Are you feeling anxious? Are you using that for comfort? Okay, how do we address that? Let's talk about these things. Maybe even creating ways to connect with your child so that they have that connection. Um, I know it gets more difficult. And I, the problem is I don't have a teenager. So I feel like I'm going to kind of have to wing it and see what happens when I think and all parents feel that way. So I don't know that one size fits all. But the mm -hmm. idea is just to say, listen, this is my wind down routine. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me show you what's good. 
you know, if, if mommy's always having a glass of wine in her hand, they're going to learn that that's how mommy unwinds. And, and believe me during COVID, I was guilty of having a glass of wine in my hand when I got home from work. Now I don't do that anymore. Cause I'm like, no, I don't want them to be like, I'm going to draw a picture and mommy always has a glass of wine in her hand. It's going to be Mommy is doing other things. She's cuddling with us on a couch. We have a show that we like to watch together. We read. We do other things. And being able to forge that connection. And also, too, oh, you can't be on your phone. Give me your phone. Oh, but mommy has to do a bunch of work on my phone, right? We got to mimic. We got to model the behavior that we think is good for our sleep and know is good for our sleep for our children. So that's where I would really start with those things. And that mm-hmm. includes even something as how active you are. Yes. If I'm a schlub who never moves their body, my kids are going to see a schlub who never moves their body. I've got to be active because then I demonstrate to them what it's like for them to be active. And that is my kids see me lifting. They see me doing my home Pilates class. They're seeing me do stuff. So I'm really trying to encourage them through my actions to do that and just know the more you kind of, if they've got a lot of extra energy, see if they can bounce it out somewhere, you know, get them to be more active as opposed to sitting down and engaging with technology or computer gaming all the time. Because before you know it, you know, it's no wonder they have that extra. They got to physically be tired as well as mentally tired. So those are very broad stroke recommendations. And, you know, no one size, like I said, fits all. But I think it really starts with creating that environment where people feel free to work together as a family unit to create, believe it or not, I think you'll be closer as a family. And that security, I think, would be really, really helpful for our kids too. I agree 100%. But also, I think sometimes it might mean seeking help, right? Yes, absolutely. Somebody like you that is going to be able to take a broader, more overall view of what might be happening. Sometimes you just need a professional to step in and um, figure that out for you. And I think you're bringing up another incredibly important point, which is, you know, not everything is, okay, if you do X, Y, or Z, it's going to get better. If you sense, and, and you're really hitting home here, if you sense just as equally common as chronic sleep deprivation and difficulty sleeping, aka insomnia is, so is sleep disorder breathing. So we would be completely remiss if we didn't put the elephant in the room here and say, listen, sometimes you may notice some funky thing. You know, if your teenager is really struggling to get up and they're so sleepy, or they're just like, every time I go to sleep, I keep waking up. Listen to that. Is there something else going on? Restless legs is fairly common. Obstructive sleep apnea is relatively common. And talk to folks. If you're a dentist, you know, you're taking your teen to the dentist, your kid to the dentist, they're like, you know, your kids seem to be grinding a lot. I'm noticing something, you know, I'm noticing how their airway seems to be very crowded. These are important markers that there could be something else going on. And like you mentioned, speak to a professional and don't ignore your dentist when they say stuff like this, because we need all the help we can get. There's only so many of us sleep providers to go around. And you guys are often the source of a referral to the sleep doctor because you're noticing things that even the primary care may not have time to deal with. You know, they're dealing with every other organ system. Sleep often gets kind of pushed aside and it's not really their fault. It's simply just one more thing you have to do in a short period of time, and it can't always get addressed. Exactly. Um, A lot of times patients don't have the option or the opportunity or the luxury to work with a provider such as yourself. So you do provide telemedicine. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. I provide telemedicine services for anyone who's interested in the New York, New Jersey, California, and Georgia. Area. Perfect. And how would they find you or work with you? Before I jump into that, I just want to point out to our listeners, I will be posting Dr. Cole's bio, her website, her social media handles, everything in the show notes. She also has an amazing podcast. Talk about that a little bit. So people know to follow you and subscribe to your podcast before we jump into what working with you would look like for those that might be interested. Sure. So the name of my podcast is called Sleep is My Waking Passion. And I, like you, love to chat with folks of all different experiences. Um, You don't have to be a physician to speak to me. I've spoken with dentists. I've spoken with people who have social worker backgrounds that have a deep interest and connection. A lot of uh, psychiatrists and psychologists who work with folks. There's a lot of us that are really interested in sleep. Not all of it is 
quote, a sleep disorder, end quote. But, you know, there are a lot of people out there that are willing to help you and be available to you. And I just try to have really open, honest discussions with them about whatever topic they're interested in. I try to do the latest. You know, I know you and I share a lot of similar interests and themes when I look through what Healthy Sleep Revolution has spoken with. So if you're just looking for a different perspective, want to you know, hear a different person talk, check us out. You know, I'm, I'm there. I love doing this. I love being part of other people's podcasts. It's, it's really been a lovely journey and it is truly deep in my heart. What I know I was meant to do in this stage of my life. So I have no regrets about not doing what I was doing before. I can tell you that you're still doing what your heart was meant to do. So, and I'm grateful for that. I truly am. (laughs) So let's dive into how people can find you, how people can work with you, what that would look like for them. Sure. So if I have some blog posts, affiliate links for some, um, you know, things that I support that I think are actually helpful for helping you sleep, you can check me out at ask sleepmd.com. You can also, if you're interested in working with me, go to oak.care slash sleep. Okay. So for all those of you who are listening, I'm going to be transparent and tell you I am an out of network provider, but I use anything that insurance will cover in terms of testing using your insurance plan. If you need treatment for your sleep apnea or healthcare plan, um, it's really more about where we're out in this stage of the game. And as you know, most of your providers are all linked to larger organizations than I once was. I want to provide really quality sleep services to you. I want to listen to you. And that takes time. You know that. And so I offer 60 minute and 30 minute visits. And we are about to add a new feature to our website that you can actually submit for reimbursement straight to your insurance. So while my services may personally be out of network, we're trying to make it easier for you to get reimbursed by insurance um, using a program that we're looking at. So I'm really, really um, excited for the the growth of this tiny but mighty sleep telemedicine program that we have. I think it's amazing and so needed. So I'm glad there is an option for those that will benefit from this. As we wind up our episode today, um, what are your top three tips when it comes to sleep, sleep health um, for our listeners? First of all, sleep will come. We're human beings who need to sleep. So try not to stress about it. Just look at it like you got to do the right things. So you actually surrender to sleep, right? I think a lot of us, whether we admit it or not, tend to delay our sleep because we're feeling like we don't have enough time to ourselves or we're just too busy and we have been working too late and we just didn't give ourselves enough time to wind down. Um, Don't get into bed and be frustrated. You can't go to sleep. The key is to give yourself that space to just be, right? We talked about sitting down and being bored. It's okay. Give yourself that downtime, all right? So don't try not to stress about sleep. The second is, I really cannot emphasize how great it is to really focus on a regular routine and a regular, mm-hmm. so really emphasize a regular wake up time. Try to be really consistent. If you're struggling with sleep, that's the first thing I would say, just get up the same time every single day, realistic to you. Meaning, and the last but not least would be small incremental changes to improve your sleep. Don't wake up at 10 a.m. every day and then go, well, Dr. Cole said I should have a regular wake up time. And my ideal wake up time would be seven o'clock in the morning. So I'm just going to get it set up at seven o'clock every day. That's an unrealistic expectation. But maybe if you're trying to reset your clock a little bit, maybe 930 is a more realistic slot. And then that gets comfortable. And then maybe it's nine o'clock. And then you slowly work your way back. So just be kind to yourself. Big changes are hard, but sleep is one of those things where incremental changes go a long way. That plus routine. That's amazing. Right. Valuable tips right there for those that are listening. I hope you were taking notes. Well, I want to thank you once more for taking time out today out of your very busy schedule. And spending time with us, with my listeners and all of this amazing information. For those that are listening in, like I mentioned, we will drop her bio, ways to contact her, social media handles, website, any information you may need. Please go subscribe to the podcast. Um, Tons of great information that she shares on there. And you know somebody that could benefit from this information. Share this episode and like I said, follow Dr. Cole. Well, thank you so much once again. And we will see you next time. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you at Sleep 2024. Yes, indeed.